Welcome to Meldon Law and Friends. I'm Jeffrey Meldon, attorney and founder at Meldon Law, and welcome. Uh, we all got through Thanksgiving, and uh, we're getting ready for uh, the holidays. Uh, it's going to be uh, a big time this year. Let's see, we got uh, Christmas is on um, Monday, New Year's Eve is on a Sunday night, so I guess... Uh, uh, Mondays are going to be days off uh, coming up. I think Mel. I think we're taking off Monday and Tuesday for uh, the Christmas holiday, and uh, we got uh, Sunday nights, New Year's Eve. Everybody goes back to work on uh, uh, Tuesday, so that's what's going on at Meldon Law as far as the vacation. However, this is a big time for us because. Uh, the insurance companies want to get a lot of their personal injury cases off their books before the end of the year. They have to hold money in reserve for um, cases that are not settled. So it's a busy time at Meldon Law. We're trying to get uh, a lot of holiday money for our clients and settle cases in the next uh, three, four weeks is really, really busy. Once uh, Christmas time comes uh everybody pretty much takes off for vacation so it's hard to get anything done so uh this is it the uh you know the last uh you know the last three weeks uh f of the year where we're really cranking it out and uh, we hope everybody uh had a wonderful thanksgiving is looking forward to a great uh holiday season uh we celebrate uh uh Hanukkah starting December 7th. So uh, that's going to be uh, fun. The evening of December 7th is when we light our first uh, candle on the menorah. And uh, we're all excited about that. Um, we're, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going to Disney World with my uh, grandchildren and daughter and son-in-law over the... Uh, Christmas holiday, so it should be uh, a nice time here in uh, North Central Florida. A couple other things going on. Lake City, December 7th, um, we're having the Community Appreciation Party there, holiday party from 5.30 to 9. Uh, we're going to do it at Prohibition, which is a great little club there. And uh, we want to, uh, we're going to have live music. Let's see, we got Josh Nettles playing. It's going to be an uh, absolute blast. Um, really nice time. So uh, come and join us. Though If you're in uh, Lake City, you know where Prohibition is downtown. So uh, have a good time. A uh, couple other things. Uh, if you're not on our Meldon Law newsletter list, you better get on it right away. Just uh, uh, go to meldenlaw.com and uh, sign up for the newsletter list. Uh, in the December edition, which will be coming out in a week or so, we are giving away a $25 gift certificate to Harry's Seafood Bar and Grill in Ocala, Gainesville, and all their locations, actually. And it's a great way to uh, spend the holiday getting together with friends and family uh, for a nice uh, dinner. Uh, speaking of great places for a nice dinner, we're here at Spurrier's Gridiron Grill, and uh, they're going to be doing a great holiday celebration. As I walked into the studio here today, I uh, saw everybody putting on the uh, decorations, the Christmas decorations, uh, appropriately, they waited for Thanksgiving to be over. In, in uh, recent years, people start, uh, you know, doing the Christmas decorations after Halloween, and they start doing the Halloween decorations in August. So uh, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, Spurrier's Gridiron Grill, great museum, great uh, restaurant. The food is terrific. Um, there, a lot of friends. Uh, of mine went here last Sunday for their Sunday brunch. Wow, they had a blast. Uh, the Sunday brunch here uh, is really to die for. Uh, you you want to include Spurriers during your uh, holiday plans. A uh, couple other things we got going on. Um, ticket 
giveaways for Gator basketball. Now that uh, Gator football's over, we got basketball, and we have a very exciting team. I predict they're going to be a, uh, a ranked team by the end of the year. So if you uh, want free tickets, just go to our Facebook page, uh, Meldon Law, and uh, you will be able to get free tickets uh, with uh, just enter. There's no obligation. So anyhow, it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. You're really going to uh, have a good time with Gator basketball. Uh, bring the family. Have a great time. Uh, January 6th at 1230 on a Saturday, the Kentucky Wildcats are coming to town. It's always a huge game. Kentucky has a uh, great following. And Mel that's going to be Meldon Law Day uh, for the Gators. So uh, I think my wife Patricia and I are going to get a game ball. We're going to be uh, jumping around on the court, having a good time. And everybody there is going to get a really nice uh, Gator T-shirt to take home with them. So put it on your calendar, January 6, 1230, Saturday uh, for Kentucky. Uh, last but not least, we just republished my uh, very uh, well-received book, which is Buying Florida Auto Insurance, A Three-Step Approach. Uh, the book, book, Consumer Guide, whatever you want to call it, it's short. It's free. We'll send it to you. Just go to uh, um, MeldonLaw.com uh, or give us a call at the office, 352-373-8000, and we'll be glad to uh, send you one free. You can also download it on our website, MeldonLaw.com. And, and it uh, explains, number one, the first step is learn a little bit about what coverages there are in Florida because Florida is different from all the other states what kind of coverages we have uh, for auto insurance number two talk to your local uh, insurance agent to find out what your needs are based on your income and assets and things like that and then number three you can uh, shop for price uh, oftentimes we find that uh, your local agent will be able to get you uh, as good a price as anybody online or by calling the 800 numbers. We do caution people not to uh, go uh, online or go uh, call an 800 number unless you really have learned, done your homework and, and you've learned what kind of coverage you need. You don't want to buy too much. You don't want to buy too little. Most people, though, uh, buy too little because they're focused only on uh, price, not what they need. If you're buying health insurance, people really p pay attention to what they need. If you same with life insurance, other kinds, homeowners insurance. For some reason, when people buy uh, auto insurance, all they want to do is get the lowest price, which means lower uh, coverage. So uh, you may save money today and lose 25 times that amount of money that you saved later on because you didn't have the proper coverage. So uh, be careful. Uh, make sure that you do your homework. Again, that's uh, uh, our Meldon Law, How to Buy Florida Auto Insurance at a Competitive Rate. Just call the office, 352-373-8000, and we'll send you a free copy. Or go to our website, MeldonLaw.com. You really need this book. I just gave a good friend of mine uh, a copy this weekend. He, was, uh, he heard our radio show on the sky every Saturday morning at 1030 talking about uh, insurance, and uh, it piqued his interest because he's from Ohio. And uh, he didn't uh, know all the details of Florida insurance. So we're glad to help you out. You can get insurance. In fact, if uh, you read the book and you have any questions, all you have to do is uh, send me a copy of your insurance rates and I'll make some suggestions as far as what kind of coverages you need. We're going to take a quick break on Meldon Law and Friends and we'll be back with our special guest, Jorge 
severe. Jeffrey, what are you doing? Well, I'm joining the band, of course. Since Melvin Law is the official law firm partner of the Florida Gators, I want to help. Dad, we're litigators. Let's stick to helping people in the courtroom. Well, can we still hang out and jam a little bit? At Melden Law, we won't back down. The Kiara Grace Foundation proudly presents An Evening with Tim Tebow, Thursday, November 30th at the Touchdown Terrace at Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. Experience a once-in-a-lifetime VIP meet and greet with Tim. Hear his heartfelt stories and his unyielding dedication to the most vulnerable. With your support, we can extend the reach of the Kiara Grace Foundation to save precious lives in Latin America. Get your ticket before they sell out. Don't miss your chance to meet Tim Tebow, be inspired, and make a tangible difference. I was going down a one-way street and a girl that was driving her car T-boned me on my scooter. I ended up going for an MRI and discovering that I had two herniated discs. Coming to Cary allowed me to not have to worry about what doctor I was gonna see or what physical therapist I had to go to. They say, these are the people we trust. You're gonna have a great experience there. And I honestly did each time. Call Melden Law. Your consultation is absolutely free. I was driving behind a lady and very suddenly she moved out of the way. There was a log laying in the road. And when I hit my brakes, I went on top of the log. I had 280 discs. I just haven't been the same since. Jeffrey Melden fought for me all the way. Him and his team really went there for me. Throughout the whole lawsuit, he made sure that my bills was paid. It was never no whenever I called him and asked him for something. Call Melden Law right now. And I was in an accident. Someone ran a red light and hit me, and I was hurt. You don't know where to turn. Luckily, I called Jeffrey. These big insurance companies, they don't want you to win. They truly don't. But Jeffrey and his firm and the people that work here, they just really fight for you. You call the law offices of Jeffrey Belden because you're going to need help, and they will help you. Call Melden Law right now. Hey, Sammy, look who's there. Say hi. Hey. Again. Melvin Law, Jeffrey speaking. Jeffrey! Somebody, Somebody hit else! Us. Hit yeah, us. Yeah. Here we go again. Welcome to Melvin Law and Friends. We have a great guest for us today, Jorge Sevilla, who is a immigration attorney, uh, lives in Ocala and services North Central Florida. Welcome to the show, Jorge. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here again. Yeah. So uh, anyhow, I have a special, um, you know, interest in immigration law. Um, my daughter, Jessica, uh, was an immigration attorney okay. uh, for a couple of years, and uh, she kind of told me what was going on. She was uh, down in Miami, and she wound up uh, in the courtroom a lot because she was handling... Uh, Cases where they're trying to deport people and defense. stuff like right, that, right. and uh, so, but she worked for a firm that did a lot of investment uh, visas. Uh, right. So, what I want to uh, find out is, what is your main area of practice in immigration law, and how did you get interested in it? Sure, sure. Well, first off, um, I've had the experience as well over my ten-year career as an attorney to represent individuals in removal defense, um, being deported and family petitions and the like. But recently, uh, I just I pivoted into uh, representing companies. So what I do is I do employment visas, investment visas to assist these employers in bringing in foreign talent to the United States. Yeah, I know in um, in the Ocala Marion County area. Um, there's a very strong Hispanic population. Yes, there is. And that, uh, although the folks that you represent aren't necessarily Hispanic. No, no, uh, I represent people from a various number of countries, from different regions, Europe, Australia, 
you know, Africa, Asia, uh, and Hispanics, and South America, and Central America. So w right now, what are some of the most common um, cases that you're working on as far as the employment uh, issues? Every year, definitely, um, what, we, what I always see, and I tend to help employers with, is the H visas. H visas range from H-1B visas, which are for specific specialty occupations, and also there's H-2As and H-2Bs. The H-2A category is mostly for agricultural workers, people that are working in, farm, uh, in the farm industry. And H-2Bs are non-agricultural workers, which range from uh, your, your landscapers and even individuals who are um, construction workers and the like. Uh, those visas are typically limited to about 66000 a year, uh, and they're divided into um, 33000 per uh, half per fiscal year. Uh, so every half of fiscal year between October to April, the first 33 are filled by the end of October. And how many applicants do they have for those uh, visas? For those type of visas, you're looking well over uh, hundreds of thousands of, of applicants. Uh, so in, in the last couple of years, we've seen USCIS, which is the agency that is responsible for um, authorizing these visas. They've expanded and given supplemental um, issuances of another 66,000 or about 67,000 visas because there is such a need here in the United States. Well, how about in Marion County? I know it's the horse capital of the world, right? Right, right. So definitely the horse capital of the world. You're seeing a lot more uh, employers in need of filling these positions here in the United States. Unfortunately, they're not finding sufficient workers, so they're using uh, these visas that, uh, that are at their disposal either for uh, ranch ranch hands or for individuals who are assisting with the equestrian side of it. Um, they bring in individuals through the H-2A or H-2B programs as well. And, and, and what are the requirements for those programs? Uh, typically, uh, you're dealing with two agencies when you're petitioning an individual through this. So first off, you have to deal with the Department of Labor. They have to go through the Department of Labor to uh, determine what the prevailing wage is, because they have to pay the prevailing wage for that type of position, depending on the locality. And two, they have to indicate that they've tried, the, the employer has made efforts to fill that position with US qualified workers. Mm -hmm. Now, once there's no qualified workers available or ready to enter into that position, now these positions can be offered to the individuals who they're looking to bring from abroad. And uh, what do the employers have to do uh, money-wise in order to bring them from abroad? A lot of times um, they're responsible for the actual process, paying for the, the uh, filing fees and um, finding a location. Then they don't necessarily have to pay for the lodging of these individuals who are coming here, but they have to assist them in finding the, the lodging so that they can, um, so, so they have somewhere to stay while they're employed here in the United States. So uh, the bottom line is uh, the United States government uh, wants to make sure that they're not um, a burden on society and that they're they're getting a fair wage They're able to uh, carry themselves. They got a place to live. They're not going to be on welfare Exactly, exactly. That's that's the reason why they go through the Department of Labor is to determine whether They're being paid the, the correct price the fair price and additionally once their time is up That employer has to ensure that that person's returning back to their country. Right. So the, these are not folks that are coming in here uh, and able to get a green card, which could lead to eventually lead to citizenship. Some of these individuals are only looking to come here temporarily or on a seasonal basis. Uh, but there are opportunities through these visa types now. And more recently, uh, the government has made it, um, has passed certain regulations that uh, can assist these individuals in obtaining a green card if the employer or another employer wishes to hire them on a more permanent basis. So in the horse capital of the world, Ocala, uh, what are some of the um, challenges that employers have as far as getting workers? I mean, you, you know, I hear that, oh, you know, there's lots of Mexican workers that come into Florida and work on the horse farms. Is that accurate? Um, for, for, for a large percentage of these positions, yes, there's a lot of Mexican individuals who have come and have experience in that industry. Now, what we have to make sure um, when I'm when I'm speaking with these companies and with these employers is that the individuals have the proper authority to work in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, you're faced with individuals who may have crossed the, um, you know, crossed a port of entry and don't have the proper documentation, whether it's a visa or a permit to work. So, unfortunately, those employers 
will not be able to hire them. And that's one of the challenges you see is that you have some undocumented workers, but unfortunately these employers, in order to um, be in accordance with U.S. law, they're not able to employ them. So. Didn't the Florida legislature make some changes that made it more difficult for undocumented workers in the state of Florida? We saw some challenges, yes, uh, early on this year, and in, in, uh, if I'm... I stand corrected. It's uh, July. In July, there was a law that was passed that made it uncomfortable for a lot of individuals who were here uh, unlawfully or didn't have the proper documentation. Now, I know that there are some challenges to that law because of, of supremacy. You know, the, the United States government is the government that's entitled under the Constitution to make federal immigration. Oh, rather than uh, the state. Rather I than see. the state. So. Uh, okay, so yeah. it was a question of. Does the federal government make the law, or, do, or, right. can, or does the state have, or is the state infringing on the authority of the federal government? Okay, so I got it. Um, but I, I had heard that you know it was created uh, difficult circumstances not only for the workers but for the employers yeah, because you know it's especially agriculture and you right. know in the horse industry. It reinforced some of the requirements that are already in place. Uh, for example, E-Verify, it required that if a Florida company is employing 25 or more employees, they must use the E-Verify program. But that's already a requirement based on federal law, is that an individual has to, uh, a company has to verify the employment status or the ver um, employment verification through either an I-9 or the E-Verify program. Yeah, I'm, I know a lot of uh, people in the agricultural industry um, they, you know, when it comes harvest time or whatever, mm -hmm. they need they need help, and that uh, it sometimes creates issues. I know Alabama made a really strict law eight or ten years ago, and it turned the whole farming industry upside exactly, down. Yeah. and they went to the legislature and say, "Look, guys, um, we can't live with this because we need help on our farms." Oh, definitely, it affects everybody. I mean, the produce we get. And, and, and the dairy that we get in our grocery stores is coming from these same farms that we're talking about. So you yeah. see that issue, you know, trickle down. So um, the, that, what we've just been talking about are uh, ways in which to, to get folks in mm -hmm. uh, who, is this for people that have particular skills? Yes, I mean, with the, with the U.S. immigration system, a lot of times what you could see is that there are certain visa types available for certain individuals who have a specific type of education or a specific type of investment ability, uh, financial ability. So yes, we do see that through the different um, investment programs, the different employment-based options that are available to U.S. employers. Let's talk about something that I've heard about for years since my daughter was practicing immigration law, the sure. EB-5 immigration uh, investor program. How does that work? Well, the EB-5 program was designed to help with economic development throughout the United States. So over time, things have changed. Initially, the program was designed to allow investors to invest either 500000 minimum in a specific area within the United States or a million dollars. Uh, more recently, though, those amounts have gone up due to inflation. I mean, th the law was passed in the 1990s. So based on that, Congress determined that the amounts needed to go up to allow for uh, better economic development and allow the U.S. government to facilitate and, and grow the economy. So now if, if you have the money uh, to uh, invest, what are some of the requirements and how you use that money in job creation and Definitely. things like that? So this opportunity is great for an investor who has the financial ability to do so. The reason why is that the program allows for permanent residence at the end of it. So first off, like I said, it's either nowadays it's either an investment of $800,000 in a targeted employment area as defined by the government, which means an area that is experiencing a higher level of unemployment or it's a rural area based on population size. So once the investor is able to make that investment of $800,000, the requirement is that they have to create at least 10 jobs for U.S. qualified workers. Now that means for either U.S. citizen, a permanent resident, or individuals who are authorized to work with a work authorization document. And if they're able to um, grow this enterprise within a two-year period, they go from a conditional green card to a more permanent green card. And, and the advantage of a green card, yes. yeah, uh, the advantage of of a green card 
is that you can stay in the United States um, for an unlimited period of time, Correct. number Inde one. Indefinitely. Yeah. Indefinitely. And uh, it also gives you the ability to apply for citizenship after a certain number of years. Correct. Correct. Definitely. Uh, with this type of program, uh, they would be eligible to apply for uh, citizenship within five years of getting their green card. So you come in, you, you have, uh, you know, a little over a million dollars. You create uh, at least 10 jobs. You maintain that for at least two years. And then you're eligible uh, to, for yourself mm -hmm. to get a, um, a green card. For yourself and your family, yes. So and long your as your children are under the age of 21... And for your spouse as well. They all yeah. will be able to d obtain that. Yeah, my, uh, I know my wife um, came here from Venezuela about 24 years ago. Okay. And since she was born in Cuba, she had the advantage of the Cuban Adjustment Act. Correct, correct. That and, was a great advantage. And that was a great advantage. And she was going to come here for a year and get, a, um, get her green card mm -hmm. And uh, take care of, uh, you know, uh, leading to citizenship if she needed it. Right. Uh, however, her family had a successful business back in Venezuela, and she um, uh, was planning on going back to Venezuela and working in the family business. However, 9-11 okay. occurred, Oof. and uh, things, nothing was happening for a while because they were trying to figure out. Oh, well, that was a big shift. It went from... INS, the Immigration Naturalization Service, to what we have today, the Department of Homeland Security, which is a number of sub-agencies. So, yeah, a, a lot of people experience that. Lucky for me, she's decided to stay here. <laughs> and uh, what she told me at that time was she has twins. And uh, when they came here, they were eight. I think mm -hmm. she told me when she got citizenship through... Uh, the Cuban Adjustment Act and, mm -hmm. you know, getting a green card that um, if her kids were, if they were under 14, they were auto at that time, they were yeah. automatically given citizenship as well. Right. They're able to derive for specific programs and for spe uh, specific uh, types of visas. There's a certain age requirement. Um, step, step parent relationships as well have to be established before the age of 18. Uh, mm -hmm. Adoptions, certain adoptions have to be done before the age of 16 of the child, and they have to reside with the parent for a certain amount of time. So, yeah, I could see that. I could see those the specific requirements. Now, what about uh, folks that get married? So, say um, somebody uh, from the United States, a U.S. citizen, marries somebody from a foreign country. Um, how does that go as far as that person being able to get a green card and eventually citizenship? Uh, there's a, a, a number of different avenues. Um, as you know, I'm sure you've seen the TLC program, 90 Day Fiancé. Well, that, that's based on uh, one of the visa types that's available. It's a fiancé visa. So the choice comes um, for, that, for that couple comes, well, do we get married before I petition you to come to the United States? Or do we get engaged? And then what the fiancé visa allows is that the person, the reason why it's 90 Day Fiancé is that the visa, once it's authorized, the person can come here to the United States for the purpose of getting married, but they have to get married within 90 days of arriving to the mm -hmm. United States. So once they once they arrive, they're able to get married, and now they go through the process of adjusting status, which is becoming a permanent resident. Um, and at that point, they have to establish that they're cohabitating, that they're living as a married couple. And it would be the same thing for a person who's, let's say they're not choosing to use the fiancé visa, they could still petition their, their significant other so long as they demonstrate that they've been married, that they've developed a relationship, and that they meet certain requirements under the law to show that they are a married couple. So is uh, social media had an effect on uh, having more people coming in uh, to the United States that way? I would believe so. I mean, social media has changed the landscape all around, but definitely um, it gives uh, immigration or USCIS officers an opportunity to delve into somebody's life and determine are these individuals actually married? And in some cases, unfortunately, they find out that they're not legitimately a couple because let's say the person on social media posted another picture with someone else. They unfortunately get caught. and, and Well, not unfortunately, they get caught because they're not doing the proper thing. <laughs> well, so, um, you, you know, you hear this term mail order brides, okay, and stuff like that. You know, a, a girl from Russia who, uh, you know, uh, a, you know, 
post a uh, really <laughs> hot picture on, on the uh, you know whatever services there are. So that if, if somebody said I'm getting engaged to you, could they could come over for ninety days? Well, again, there's always specific requirements under the visa. They would have to demonstrate that they've met in the past. Oh, within... so that's why the guy would have to go over there first. Right. You have to establish that there's some form of relationship. Okay, well, social media communications, you can establish that, email, text, phone calls, conversations, but there has to be a, there is a requirement that requires physical, uh, being physically present with each other and demonstrating that there's an intent to get married. Correct. Yeah. Well, I know that it's, um, that there's some people that uh, really try to follow the rules. You know, there's some people that try to game the system. Uh, Yeah, you see that all the time. However, you know, it's interesting because what you do is try to do it legally, you know, uh, and it's, I know that there's, you know, people flooding you know the the borders in the southern United States. Um, however, um, that issue has to do with people that are not going through the proper channels. Correct. Well, it's a humanitarian issue. It comes down to what's going on in specific countries. You know, Venezuela, the Nicaraguas, the Honduras, the Guatemalas. So um, it it it's not technically illegal, in the sense that what happens is that the individual must present themselves at the border. And they're given the opportunity that if they meet the specific requirements of showing that they have a credible fear of returning to their country and they're being persecuted, now they establish and they go back through the process as your daughter represented individuals in court, is that they're given the opportunity due process to demonstrate that they meet the requirements of asylum. If they don't meet the requirements of asylum, then that's when the judge makes a determination and says, unfortunately, we have to deport you back to your country. Now, when you say present yourself at, at the border, um, is it? Is there a difference between, you know, presenting yourself at the border and, you know, going ac- across the Rio Grande River? Yes, there is a difference. But at the same time, once they're in the United States, they have to, if, if they're encountered by uh, Customs and Border Protection, at that point they're processed and they're either expeditedly removed, which means they're, they're removed without being able to go in front of a judge, or if they express a fear of returning to their country, then that's when it initiates the asylum process and they're able to go through that. Correct, yeah. yeah. Now, in Florida, are most of the people, um, well, I, people that haven't been uh, admitted to the United States through um, some... Port of entry, right. Port of entry, correct. Um, are, are most of those people folks that, like the Mexican workers, that um, we have a lot of agricultural workers from Mexico. Throughout the state, yes. So what do most of those folks, they they could, I guess, come over through uh, the southern border or fly here on some kind of a vacation visa or something? Well, it, it depends. I'm going to give you the attorney answer. It depends because in order for you to get on a plane, you have to have some type of visa or permit to travel, a parole document or something. So a lot of times what, what happens with these individuals that are already here within the state is yes, they came through the border and uh, either they weren't encountered or they were encountered and um, they've been given an order of removal and they just chosen to stay. Okay. Now, some of these individuals are, are non-criminal. They haven't committed any other offense other than a civil infraction of violating, <laughs> excuse me, U.S. immigration law. So at that point, it becomes very difficult for employers to either petition them or for them to even try to change their status. Why is it um, so difficult for the United States to patrol the southern border so that there can be a more orderly process? Wow, that, that, that's probably a conversation that would be <laughs> more than the five minutes we have here. But, <clears throat> um, you know, different administrations drive different things, you know. There's technology nowadays. They have drones available. They have other means of technology to, to monitor the border. So I, I, I'm honestly a, I'm at a loss at times as, as to why they can't they can't patrol it uh, effectively, or you know why we can't have more more officers processing individuals. Uh, one of the biggest things you see now is that recently they've created an app where individuals are presenting themselves at the border or they're encountered and they're being held in Mexico for the time for them to do their interview and they're notified in the app that their interview is now available so that they can do their credible fear 
or present their their case uh, before a, a customs officer? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm glad my ancestors were able to get in uh, <laughs> because my ancestors came here, you know, around uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Was it through and, Ellis Island? Or yeah, it through was Ellis Island. Island. Yeah, one, one, I had uh, one grandparents who came from uh, Lithuania area and the other from Ukraine. Oh, wow. So, uh, but they got in well over 100 years ago through... Right. Uh, different times. <laughs> well, actually, um, on my father's side, you know, they came from Kiev and uh, they they were uh, killing Jewish people just mm. because they were Jewish and they got on the first boat that they could get on and wound up in Montreal. They stayed wow. there for a year. My my uncle Maury was born there and then they moved to Cleveland, Ohio where uh, my mother and father were born and raised. And, so you're from uh, Cleveland as I'm well. I'm from Cleveland nice. as well, yeah. So I'm second generation born in the United States. Um, <clears throat> however, most of our, fa our, our friends and family, um, their families immigrated from Europe or uh, Russia. And uh, I think it was, what, 1924, the Immigration Act was, there was a major immigration right. act that put quotas on the number of people that could come in. So after 1924, the whole thing changed. Oh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, being Jewish, it was a, a, a horrible because the United States during uh, World War II were not allow, uh, allowing the um, Holocaust uh, victims to come to the United States because of the quotas. Wow. And uh, there well, was yeah, there was a big shift right after the war as well. You saw that, you saw a change in immigration law as well. And, and like I said, uh, asylum law is based on the Hague Convention, and these countries come into an agreement because of refugees and individuals such as the people in the Holocaust and in other parts of the world that are being persecuted just because of their their nationality, their their gender, their just who they are. So um, that that was part of the Hague Convention. Correct. So, a, lot, a lot of the stuff we see in asylum law is because of the agreement that came between these countries that came together afterwards. <clears throat> we have to make a change as to being able to accept individuals who are suffering persecution. So um, I want to do a wrap up here sure. with Jorge Sevilla, who is our immigration attorney in North Central Florida office in Ocala, Florida. Um, I If folks... Um, want to come into the United States and have money to invest and help develop uh, North Central Florida uh, with good jobs and, uh, uh, and they have the ability to put together a little over a million dollars, um, call Jorge. He will explain to you how the uh, EB-5 visa works. And if you're an employer and you want to bring in certain skilled workers, uh, call Jorge. What's your uh, phone number? It's uh, 407-906-4622. And your um, website? It's uh, INA, like the Immigration Nationality Act, ESQ.com. So that's INA, ESQ.com. And it's Jorge, J-O-R-G-E, last name Sevilla, S-E-V-I-L-L-A. See, you're so great they named a city in Spain after you. I know, right? <laughs> so anyhow, we want to thank you very much for coming here. Look, um, immigration law is really, really um, important. It's complicated. Get a lawyer. Uh, if you try to do it on your own, uh, I can tell you from personal experience with people that we know uh, you need the help of a lawyer. And a lot of times, look, call Jorge if you have a question. He'll talk to you. He ain't going to charge you $500 to spend a few minutes on the phone to find out if you need his services. Uh, what's the phone number again? It's 407-906-4622 or 352-789-3513. 
So uh, we're doing a wrap on Meldon Law and Friends. Thank you very much, Jorge, for joining us. Thanks again for having me. It's a, uh, a, a great resource for uh, anyone who's in business and uh, needs help bringing in the kind of uh, team workers that you need. Uh, we didn't get into all the uh, details, but believe me, there's lots of opportunity um, if you have a skilled lawyer on your side. Thank you very much for listening to Melden Law and Friends, and we'll be back next week with another great edition.